بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد شيخ عبد الرحمن ابن ناصر السعدي رحمه الله تعالى he says وعلم أن علم التفسير أجل العلوم على الإطلاق وأفضلها وأوجبها وأحبها إلى الله know for sure that the science of tafsir, the field of tafsir, is the absolutely most excellent field of study. It is the best specialty or speciality to have. It is the best discipline to study, period. It is the most virtuous. It is the most obligatory. And it is the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لأن الله أمر بتدبر كتابه والتفكر في معانيه والاهتداء بآياته. And this is because why can we make a or how can we make a bold statement like this? Allah subhanahu wa taala has commanded us to reflect upon His book. He has ordered us to reflect upon His book. And for us to use our minds regarding the meanings of the book, the Quran. And he's also commanded us to seek and to take and to adopt guidance from Allah's book. Furthermore, Allah Azza wa He has praised and He has lauded those who do this. He has praised those individuals who do that. And he has placed them in the highest of levels and the greatest of stations. And he has also promised them the sweetest of gifts. He has promised them the sweetest of gifts, the best of gifts. فَلَوْ أَنْفَقَ الْعَبْدُ جَوْهَرَ عُمْرِهِ فِي هَذَا الْفَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا فِي جَانِبِي مَا هُوَ أَفْضَلُ الْمُطَالِبِ وَعَظِمُ الْمَقَاصِدِ وَأَصْلُ الْأُصُولِ كُلِّهَا So if a slave spends his entire life, his entire life doing this, then it would be a trifle in comparison to what he's actually doing. How virtuous and how excellent and how awesome it is to reflect upon Allah's words, to think, to use his mind, to use his brain, to ponder on the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Afdalul Matalib. The best things to do to busy yourself with, Adam and Maqasid, the greatest objectives, the highest aims, and the most fundamental fundament. The most fundamental fundament. Waqa'idatu asasat deen. And it is the most basic mainstay, the most basic prop and foundation of the religion. Wa salahu umuri dini wa dunya wal akhirah. And reflecting on Allah's book, the science of tafsir, its meanings, he says, it is the way, it is the means of having a wholesome, straight life in this life. With regards to religion, with regards to the worldly things, and with regards to the afterlife, the hereafter. فَكَانَتْ حَيَاتُ الْعَبْدِ زاهرة بالهدى والخير والرحمة وطيب الحياة والباقيات الصالحات. And thus, the slave's life, the Muslim's life, it will become bright and brilliant, shining and shimmering with guidance, with goodness, with mercy, and with fineness. He says, طيب الحياة, having a حياة طيبة, a good, fine, happy life, and باقيات الصالحات. Righteous things that will remain and righteous investments. So these are a few brief words, which, as you can clearly see, uh, with the humble translation, are utterly beautiful regarding the importance of the science of a tafsir, the science of tafsir. Now, like many other uh, issues in the religion. There are things that every Muslim has to have some knowledge about. Every Muslim has to have some knowledge about. Not every Muslim has to be a scholar. 
Not every single Muslim has to be this learned uh, pupil and this devotee to this field. But every Muslim has to have some knowledge of these things. And from that is the tafsir of the Qur'an. What do you read every day, every night, since you were a young child, now you're a grown person, and you don't know what it means? The basics? You don't have a simple understanding of what you've memorized? And what you wish to teach your children? And you spend money on sending your children to Qur'an school? And for them to memorize it, for what purpose? For them to, for you to say, my son's a hafiz? My daughter's a hafiz? No. So every Muslim... No matter how basic and simple that Muslim may be, has have to has to have some some knowledge of the tafsir of the Quran, of certain surahs, of certain ayat, of certain concepts of what the Quran means, and what can be deduced from the Quran, and how one can live and practice it on a daily basis, especially in 2018, in which Islam is under attack from so many different fronts. Islam is under attack. Mm, and there are all types of assaults levied against Islam. The Quran, Hadith, Hijab, Jihad, Sharia, Sharia law. And the list goes on and on and on on the different attacks that are made against Islam. Sometimes from the front, sometimes from the back, sometimes from the flank, sometimes pertaining, pertaining to the interpretation of Islam, sometimes pertaining to actually reading certain words and texts from the religion, and sometimes with ideological huh, warfare, psychological warfare upon the Muslims, and oftentimes it's crude physical warfare and the Muslims being killed and slaughtered. Muslims being punished, Muslims being tortured and imprisoned, and then putting the Muslims through a fitna. And this isn't anything new or anything strange, as we read in Surah Al-Buruj, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ Allah says, and the only reason why they tortured them, and the only reason why they wanted to put them to a fitna, was because they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-aziz, one exalted in might, and the one who was worthy of all praise, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, for every Muslim to have a basic grasp of the tafsir is mandatory. And for some Muslims to have a larger grasp, and a stronger, more wholesome bite, is also mandatory. And for certain Muslims to be masters and experts of the tafsir is also mandatory. But even if it isn't mandatory upon you, it's more virtue. It's light upon light. You can't go wrong. You can't lose. You can't lose by having it. It'll only make your life better. It'll only make your life more positive. It'll only allow you to live your daily life huh, easier through the stress and through the troubles, through the worries, through the drama, through the pain and the heartache of life and the world as we know it, let alone in 2018. So learning more about the Qur'an is only going to make you a better Muslim, even in Allah Ta'ala. And if Allah Azza wa wants that good for you, it's only going to bring you closer to Him and make you a better father, make you a, brother, a better mother, make you a better sister, a better brother, a better husband, a better wife. It's only going to make you a better school student. It's only going to make you a better son and a better daughter, a better community member and a better neighbor. Etc. Khayr, inshallah. This topic we could speak on for a very long time, but we won't. Moving forward, when we talk about a tafsir, before we get into a tafsir, we have to know that there are issues of tafsir which are based off of theory, or not based off of theory, but there's a theoretical study of tafsir. And there's a practical study of tafsir. There is the study of the theory and the philosophy of tafsir. The different schools of tafsir, the different ways of tafsir, huh? the different things that pertain to tafsir, and then there's actual tafsir itself. Tafsir of Surah Al-Buruj. It's a Meccan surah, it has this many ayat, this is when it was sent down, this is the main topic of the surah, these are the aims and the objectives of the surah, huh? these are the things spoken about in the surah, and then verse after verse. وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ da 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 وَحَكَبَا so there's the theory of it, and then there's the actual tafsir itself. We have usul tafsir and then we have tafsir itself. Khayr, hmm? inshallah, that's for us to be known. So every single Muslim, in my humble belief, should have a taste of both. A taste, not an absolute taste or mastery, but some taste for both of them. 
every single Muslim has to know something from Usul Tafsir. Something. Every single Muslim has to know some basic things. Meccan, Mecki and Madani. Meccan and Madani in Surah. Has to know basics. Every single Muslim has to know the basics of how the Quran is and is not to be interpreted. How many years the Quran was sent down. How the Quran sent down upon Muhammad's heart, etc. The Quran was preserved, etc. And these theoretical principles have a direct connection to another science and another discipline, another field of study, which is known as Ilm al Quran or Ulum al Quran, the sciences of the Quran, which pertain to the Qira'at, the different modes of recitation, Asbab al Nuzul, reasons behind verses being revealed, Naam, the uh, uh, top Mufassirs from the Sahaba, how the Quran was interpreted by the Prophet himself before the Sahaba and the students of the Sahaba, etc. And every single Muslim must have some basic knowledge of the tafsir itself. No matter what you do, whether you're a bread maker, or whether you're an accountant, or whether you're a, a crossing guard, or whether you're a blacksmith or a welder, whether you sell oils and perfume and lotion, no matter what you do, if a non-Muslim came up to you and asked you, what does it mean, Qulhu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad? What does that mean? Every single Muslim, no matter what their profession is, should be able to answer the question. Qulhu Allahu Ahad, basically, not the Ibn Taymiyyah tafsir, the Ibn Qayyim tafsir, the ins and outs. No, but a basic meaning. Qulhu Allahu Ahad, what's the main maqsad? What's the main objective of Surah Al Ikhlas? Every single Muslim has to know the basics. Surah Al Fatiha, the basics. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq The basics Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas The basics When was this surah sent down and why? What is this power? What is this meaning? Etc. Every single Muslim must know these basic simple things As far as the student of knowledge The talib al-ilm or the talib al-ilm Then she has to know a bit more She has to know a bit more than the basic simplicities of Qul hu A little more than the average Nine to five Muslim. And the Talib al-Ilm has to know more than just Juz Amma. He has to know the tafsir of Juz Tabarak and Juz Qad Samit wa Hakal in general. And a bit more of the Fatiha. A bit, a bigger piece, a more meaty piece than the simple basic nine to five bread making Muslim. And if the student of knowledge wishes to specialize in the field of tafsir, then that's a different story in which they'll study all of the theoretical principles, and they'll study the entire tafsir of the Qur'an, from f the, the, the entire Mus'haf, from Al-Fatiha to Nas. And of course, there are levels in that. And of course, there are styles in that, which is well known in Usul al-Tafsir. There are styles of tafsir. Hmm? There are different styles. Another reason why this is very important for Muslim to have a good, strong, basic foundation um, is that there are many Muslims today, and Allah Alam, others, and we're not talking about nobody specific, but the, the general principle clearly applies, people who don't seem to be Muslim at all, but appear as they're Muslims. They, they appear to be Muslims, but one strongly feels that they are munafiqeen, and they are zanadiqa, they're heretics that have been planted in place by the non-Muslims to destroy the Muslims and destroy Islam from within, from inside the walls of the city. And they talk about the Qur'an and its tafsir and its meanings and the science of, of tafsir and ulum al-Qur'an. And they bring all types of new principles, new understandings, new concepts. And they wish to destroy that which was agreed upon and that which was scientifically accurate of the ancient things. And they tried to whitewash, quote unquote, and just sand, uh, uh, sand wash. They tried to just totally efface the wall of tafsir and strip it brick by brick and just make it more modern and more progressive, more watered down and more uh, agreeable and acceptable to non-Muslims 
and to the changing and the modern rapid changing of the current world today. And to make the Qur'an politically correct. And to make the Qur'an something that suits everyone's desires and doesn't offend anyone and doesn't go against anyone. And we know this is impossible. And life, there's, it's impossible for you to please everyone. And the hypocrites who say that this one system of government is for everyone, or this one system of life is for everyone, for every place, they themselves, they know that that isn't true. They know that that isn't true. And they say that it is something that it is the absolute truth. And it doesn't offend anyone. It doesn't bother anyone. And it's politically correct to all. That's not true. That's not true from the non-Muslims or from among the Muslims who say that. It isn't true. From the proofs that we use to falsify this claim is that there are wars that are fought. People fight. And there's blood that is spilt. And bombs are dropped on countries to spread what these people believe is the perfect and the most uh, suited absolute form of government and of life. If it was that clear, that simple, and that easy, and it didn't offend anyone, then why do you have to fight someone and coerce them to accept it? That doesn't make any sense if it was something that didn't offend anyone, and if it was accepted by every single person. Then why do you have to bomb people into it then and brainwash people? That doesn't make sense. As far as from the Muslim aspect, then the progressive people of the tafsir, and they bring all types of uh, uh, interesting facts and numbers and word games and all types of things that they bring with regards to the tafsir. They'll accept every new modern interpretation of the tafsir or of Islam, hadith or fiqh. The hadith means this. It really doesn't mean that. Or I think the hadith means that and the third and the fourth. And the fiqh ruling, it means this and it means that. Every interpretation is accepted except for the original, classic, classical interpretation that has been around for over a thousand years. Over a thousand years. 800 years, all of the scholars from the east to the west. This was the interpretation that they gave to the hadith and to the ayah. That is unacceptable. That is old prehistoric in the Stone Age, in the Bronze Age. That is politically incorrect. That is offensive. That is misogyny, etc. So every interpretation is good and open and we respect each other. We respect everyone today, they say. We don't offend anyone. We don't disrespect anyone's opinion except for Tabri, except for Ibn Kathir, except for what al baghawi said. No, we can't take that. That's old. That's ancient. It was an Arabian interpretation of the medieval age. It, con it contains misogyny, uh, uh, it contains anti-Semiticism, it contains uh, things against LGBTQ, etc. We can't, we can't take that. But I thought you said that you were liberal and that no one would be disrespected and everyone's view would be respected. Even if you don't agree, we can agree to disagree. So this shows that there's hypocrisy in that. So in tafsir, in its theory, and in its practice, there are things which are clearly agreed upon. It's consensus. And it's unlawful to bring a new modern day interpretation, theory or in practice. And then in tafsir, there are things in which the scholars do not agree upon. And there isn't consensus. And it is open. Certain things are open for reinterpretation because there has been a great amount of, uh, of medical breakthrough, scientific breakthrough. There's no question about this with regards to geographic breakthrough, exploration, and the list goes on, things that didn't exist with regards to science and astronomy in those times. So there's nothing wrong with that, but not the core issues, not the issues of consensus, and not the issues which are the principles of the pure orthodox Islam. Obviously, this is in brief. We don't have time to mention examples. We don't have time to get into any specific details of that. But what we're trying to establish is the importance for the Muslim to get a basic solid foundation of tafsir. And these are some of the reasons. These are some of the reasons. Khairan, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, um, this is uh, very, very brief with regards to the importance of studying tafsir. 
And as we said before, that we have two main uh, tiers. We have the usul, the fundamentals of tafsir, the theory of tafsir, and we have the actual tafsir itself. Uh, just like fiqh, there's usul al-fiqh and there's actual fiqh. Usul al-fiqh, an example of a study of usul al-fiqh is that the people are either they're going to be mujtahid or muqallid, for example. Someone who's independent, who can look at the Qur'an and Sunnah and take the ruling, or someone who is to follow someone else. There is a mufti and there's a mustafti, one who's giving the fatwa and one who's asking for the fatwa. For example, there's a mustafid. That's usul. That's not actual fiqh. An actual fiqh is, what is the ruling on making wudu and wiping over business socks, thin socks, or stockings, or pantyhose? Can I wipe over them, or is it too thin and the water will get on my feet? That's a fiqh issue. That's a practical issue. It has nothing to do with the theory of fiqh. The, uh, anytime we find a hadith or an ayah in which it says, men, he, who, anyone who, then we says, then this goes for generality, that the ruling now is applicable to male and female, young and old, etc. Uh, that's usul al-fiqh. An actual fiqh principle would be, if a woman goes to Jumu'ah, she wishes to go to Jumu'ah, does she have to take a shower? Jumu'ah is an obligatory upon a woman, according to all of the scholars. But if she does go to Jumu'ah, does she have to take a shower, just like a man is to take a shower? That's a fiqh issue. So we have theory, and then we have the actual practice. Khairan, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another very important point um, with regards to theory is that the layman Muslim and the beginning student of knowledge shouldn't spend but so much time on all of the theory. Learn the principles, go through a small text, take a crash course, take some courses online, alhamdulillah, and he doesn't, or she, they shouldn't spend too much time on the theory. And they should spend the majority of their time with regards to tafsir on the actual Quran itself, on the actual practical tafsir. Also, the practical tafsir should be spent uh, mostly on the surahs that you have memorized, the surahs that you constantly read and recite and you constantly hear in the salah. The scholars of Islam, they say, from the wisdom behind Salat al-Maghrib being recited audibly, being recited out loud, Salat al-Isha being recited out loud, Salat al-Fajr being recited out loud, Salat al-Jumu'ah being recited out loud, Salat al-Eid being recited out loud. From the wisdom of those rulings <clears throat> is that these are the times in which the people are presupposed to be finished work or they're towards the end of their work day. Most people, or theoretically speaking, people have night shift, night hours, people work overnight, graveyard shift. It's different. But the asal is that the وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ on Allah says we made the day as ma'ash, a means of livelihood. Huh? We made the night as a covering. And Allah mentions in other ayat, huh? subatan mentions the day and the night and the, the purposes of the day and the night. The night is for rest and repose as a default, as a default, as default. So therefore, <clears throat> when a person is making his salah, he or she, or they're supposed to be done their work day and their day is winding down and their minds shouldn't be focused on returning back to work. Their minds shouldn't be focused on the dunya as much and earning their daily bread and milk. And that is why the Qur'an is to be recited out loud, for them to hear it and reflect on. Fajr, Aisha, the Eid, no one is supposed to be working. Juma is supposed to be an Eid, so the people have the ability to listen to the Qur'an. So this also applies, or before we move forward, the, the, the surahs that the Prophet used to recite in the Salah. And when he led the companions in the Salah. What surahs did he recite most of the time? Oftentimes he recite Juz Amma. And the reason is because of what the people need in Juz Amma. First and foremost is the Fatiha. What every Muslim needs. No prayer without the Fatiha. What are the uh, main components of the Fatiha? And how the Fatiha includes and entails the entire deen. The entire deen. The whole Qur'an is summarized in the Fatiha. The Muslim needs to hear that. And then the surahs in Juz Amma, in which one of the greatest aims 
and biggest objectives of Juzama is to affirm the creed of resurrection, to affirm the creed of afterlife, to affirm the belief in heaven and hell, and that a person will stand responsible for his or her deeds. And one can say this is the most important thing that the average Muslim needs on a daily basis. Every Muslim, even the scholar, is to realize when you wake up in the morning and when you, to, until when you go to sleep at night, you have to think about death and afterlife and what you do. What you do with your family, what you do with your employers and your employees, what you do with the people that you walk down the street with and on the train, you carpool with, at work, what you do when you eat lunch, how do you earn your money, when you come home, where do you go? Do you go to the pub, to the bar, to drink? You go to the brothel before you go home to your wife, to the whorehouse? What do you do? How do you make money? Is it haram or is it halal? What do you do during the day? Play on your phone? Play video games? What do you do all day long? How do you live your life? Are you oppressing people or are you helping people? Is your, is your dirham, is your dinar, is your money halal or haram? To think about this on a daily basis, that I am held responsible for my deeds. I'm going to be resurrected and raised and questioned about my deeds. And if they're good, then inshallah ta'ala, there's a place in which I'll be allowed entrance. And if they're not so good, then there's a place in which I may be thrown in. Okay, so this is from the most important aims and objectives of Juz Amma. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ would often recite Juz Amma in those prayers. And that is why those prayers are to be recited out loud. Everyone see the equation? 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. Khayran, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Muslim should focus, the, 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 the daily Muslim should focus on the surahs that he or she has already memorized and the surahs that he or she is going to hear the most often. If you wish to learn more of the tafsir and read more of the tafsir, then that is, as we said, light upon light, which will only help you and which will only make you, inshallah ta'ala, a better Muslim. Uh, as far as the books of tafsir, then the books of tafsir uh, is a branch of or oh, speaking about the books of tafsir is a branch of the theory of tafsir, usul at tafsir. It's a branch of that. When we talk about the mufassirun, who are the people of tafsir. But in brief, to keep things simple now, to keep things brief now, we say that the Muslim who is a layman and also a student of knowledge in the beginning they should read books and they should focus on books that have two main qualities. The first quality is concise length. Books that are the shortest and then books which are the easiest to digest, the easiest to understand, the easiest to comprehend. Short and easy, easy and short. Those are the main one, two punches that the Muslim, as a layman or laywoman, or the student of knowledge who is a beginner, should focus on. So when it comes to what book of tafsir should the Muslim study? What book of tafsir should the Muslim read? One may say, the Muslim doesn't necessarily, in the beginning, need a book of tafsir. But what one could do is learn the basic theoretical principles and learn the actual tafsir from a teacher, from a sheikh, someone who's learned him or herself, someone who knows him or herself and has the proper knowledge of tafsir and not the distorted version of tafsir. And don't think that we're saying that anything new is bad. No, we're not against new. We're not against advancement. We're against wrong. Because there are many things in the past, in ancient, which are bad and wrong. And many people, oftentimes, they go extreme in this. When they talk about new things being bad, or technology being bad, they talk about the internet. The internet is bad, it's evil, it's this and it's that. Read books, read books, read books. Don't be on the internet. Don't read, don't research on the internet. 
This website is bad. Okay. How many books are there that are hundreds of years, thousands of years old that are full of kufr and shirk? Full of kufr and shirk. And they're old as dirt, as we say. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's bad. There are books of sihr. I've seen books in bookstores, manuals and Bibles of sorcery and magic. And there are articles and PDFs, YouTube videos and things on the internet about Tawheed. So just because it's new doesn't mean it's bad. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. There are mistakes in tafsir of old. And there are mistaken mufassirin of old as well. But we're talking about the new wave and the new torrent of uh, YouTube speakers and YouTube sheikhs who oftentimes they wish to give people a new type of advanced progressive tafsir, which is oftentimes very, very, uh, uh, we would say, controversial. And oftentimes that goes against the basic principles of our Islam. And we don't have time to explain that any more uh, than what we've just mentioned. This is a brief, simple introduction. But then I tell you, we will explain more and uh, cover more ground in the following sessions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina Muhammad.